<laughs> um, all right, so uh, the first thing on our agenda is that we have an honored guest, uh, which is our health director, Amy Petrosky. And so we will uh, wait for her to come in and, uh, and she's got something to say. Hi. Hi, there she is. Welcome. Thank Hi, Amy. Hi, thanks Hi, for having Amy. me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's going to be great to hear what you have to say. Okay, so uh, should I just jump into it or do you guys want to start with questions? Well, uh, one of the things I forgot to do, so I should do that, uh, is just do a little roll call to tell people who are watching, everybody who's here. So because we can't like, you know, just raise our hands or whatever, I'll just, um, uh, you know, I'll say is somebody here and, and then you can say yes. So uh, I'm Michael Gray. I'm the, uh, the chair of the board of directors. Our vice chair is uh, uh, David. Um, David, are you here today? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, good. Yep. And then we have Cindy McNutt. I'm here. And we have uh, Melanie Mannheim. Present. Okay. Um, and uh, Kendra Levesque is still out on maternity leave. And we're hoping that uh, Christina Cooper will join us tonight. So, um, all right. And then, and then our, we, as I said before, we have a, an honored guest, our health director, Amy Petrosky. So Amy's going to talk to us, uh, and it should be real interesting. So go for it, Amy. All right. So we can, we can start with the questions uh, that I'm not sure who they came from, but Leila forwarded me some questions that came from uh, your group. Uh, the first one was specifically uh, relative to the safety of the environment of the library for the, the staff, I think was kind of the, the goal. I'm not sure who sent it. So uh, if someone wanted to elaborate or, or, or correct me, that, that would be all right. Um, but I, I think so far the town has done a really great job maintaining the safety of all of the employees, both um, in the library and all municipal buildings. Um, we set out a plan before we reopen the buildings after the spring. And I, I think so far that's being pretty well maintained. There's been some concerns and complaints that we've addressed along the way because uh, it's human nature. Wearing masks are hard, keeping six feet of distance is hard. Um, so, uh, but we're, we're always happy, the health department and both the, the fire chief, the EMD are always happy to help address those concerns. Um, the second question was relative to uh, one of the businesses in town, uh, a rehab facility. And um, so the governor has uh, regulations for every industry of business. I'm sure uh, you guys are, are familiar with kind of the different standards, whether it's a workplace, um, a gym, or a ch child's uh, boarding activity, or a restaurant. Like there are, the industry standards are... Um, specific across uh, for specific industries. So one of the things that the like a rehab facility would have to follow those specific standards and some some of the things would be maintaining uh, six feet of social distancing where able, wearing a mask, keeping a list of everybody who's in the facility at a specific time. That way if um, I was there at Monday at two o'clock and my physical therapy physical therapist was there at Monday at two o'clock with me and we were together for greater than 15 minutes, we would be able to trace back and to know who that close contact were. And we actually just had a, a situation um, like that, uh, not to actually this week, where we had to trace back within a facility just, just like that. So it does happen, but um, masks are really great at um, protecting us. So while they're not uh, an eliminating factor, so even if I'm exposed to someone who is COVID positive, uh, and we were both wearing masks. It doesn't eliminate me from being considered close contact or needing to quarantine, uh, but it does greatly reduce the likelihood that I will um, get the virus uh, from that interaction. Can I ask you the same? Uh, I had asked you that question um, because I have I had a knee replacement, so I have to go for for therapy. And I asked the the doctor if I could like do it myself at home now because I've already. I've already gotten to certain points 
And they said, no, you, you, you know, it would be really hard to get to where you need to be on your own. Cause, and I can see that cause they really push, push till you, you wouldn't be able to stand it. It would stop. <laughs> My mother's had two knee replacements and I've been there for the recovery of both of them. So I, oh. I totally understand what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, um, and my husband is extremely concerned. He doesn't want me to go because, because when I've gone, there's been like seven other patients plus the therapist and the, you know, it's not that huge a space yeah. and they do, they wipe down everything. They all wear masks. Everybody's wearing a mask. I wear a double mask, but, um, but he he's had a heart a heart attack and and he's really afraid I'll bring it home to him. Right. So and there, there so are, what would your recommendation be? Is it safe enough? Well, I'm not a medical professional, so we'll start. I understand there. that. I got that. <laughs> um, I will say that this is a really interesting thing, and uh, hopefully, people uh, there will be people watching us. I think we're only at eight right now, but as people watch it, there are un unintended consequences of a pandemic. Right, and we have saw that at the beginning. People weren't going to the hospital. People were having strokes or the everyday regular medical conditions that require medical attention and not going to get that medical attention because of COVID. And it's, it sounds like your knee replacement and the rehab to get that knee properly functioning and to mm -hmm. el eliminate the buildup of scar tissue mm -hmm. that will require a second surgery, should you not get the uh, physical therapy you need would be in a very, severe unintended consequence of the virus and right. we're going to see these unintended consequences for years to come i mean we're we are going to see um and hopefully we'll be able to do our health needs assessment and really be able to document this so we can best help our residents but this is a really great example of those unintended consequences so uh, so what i've done is what i've done is i've um i've really pushed myself hard at home and so last time he went he thought he might only have to see me one more time and I could probably do it the rest of it myself um, and then go back maybe in January to, to make sure it kept up mm -hmm. but but um, they're so booked they're so packed so and I had made the other appointments like at six at night because there's that was a great time to go there were a lot less people so I, I think I'll try to risk one more time I think and see where he he thinks if I kept it up, you know, and had the same numbers or better. Yeah. So I last time I did, I had better numbers. The medical providers. And if your doctor feels like that's a... a he thinks uh, I need to go. Then I would certainly say that there are protections in place, just like there are when we go to a, you pick up our food at a restaurant or we're in the grocery store. There are protections in place that are working. And okay. we know they're working. It was an emerging virus in the spring. We didn't have the knowledge that we have now. And that's why things are constantly evolving. It's a pain and difficult for my job and for people to follow the recommendations of the CDC or DPH because they're constantly evolving. But recently an example of that is quarantine went from 14 days to uh, test at five days out at day eight. So it's because the amount of people who become contagious after day eight has is remarkably low so the okay. risk level there is so it's constantly changing but but if you there are protections and if your doctor feels like that's a, a cause that is um important for your health then i think mm -hmm. there is uh something to be said about that well thank you for the information and it makes me feel a little better yeah. i'm gonna get out of there as quick as i can though <laughs> And you're always welcome to call the health department, you know, for specific things like that. We're always, we get calls all day long, just oh. like that. So um, feel free to call and anybody who's listening, uh, we're, we're here to help you. We're here to help make informed decisions to, and uh -huh. uh, what will help protect your family and yourselves. Yeah, that's what I was mostly looking for to, to see how big a risk it was. You know, there's some risks that are a lot bigger than others. And congratulations, Amy, congratulations for receiving the, uh, and being honored for receiving the 2020 John D. Crowley Award for Outstanding Leadership. Congratulations. There was a really nice article in the reminder. I don't know if anyone had a chance to read it, but it was a, a very big article. So congratulations to you. Thank you. That was, it was quite a big honor. It's a, it's a statewide award. And uh, I really didn't think that they were calling to, um, 
give me the award. <laughs> so it was, it was a little bit of a rough uh, first couple minutes because I was giving them names of other people who were great leaders in the field. <laughs> and they were like, I don't think you understand what's happening. And I, I, literally, I, I didn't. So I uh, couldn't be nominated. Uh, you know, usually these things are given to people in the Boston area. I mean, I'm sure the same is in your field. The people who are recognized are more of the, the city or the metropolitan areas. And uh, to be able to have made an impa impact in public health that is recognized at that level uh, is, is, was an honor. And also it, it's, it's really, I, I feel great that the service I'm giving to the residents of East Long Meadow and the businesses of East Long Meadow is one that is of quality that is recognizable across the state. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so I can give you some statistics. I don't know if there are any other more uh, other specific questions or I can just talk to you about kind of the numbers in the state of COVID in East Long Meadow. I think that would be helpful. And I think that people who actually tuned in tonight might just ask you a question, which I know is complicated, but, you know, best case, when do you think the library might be able to open back up? Well, how do I say this? It's a much higher pay grade that makes that decision than mine. Right. No, no, I understand. Uh, the, the town manager is in control of all the municipal buildings. And uh, I, I think uh, having been able to work with Mary through a pandemic, I think her focus is on the safety and well-being of not only just our employees, but the residents as well. Because when you're in an enclosed space like that, we know for a fact that that's where transmission is occurring and when masks are not in use and social distancing is not um, enforced. So I think Mary has made a very difficult decision in order to protect um, both our employees and our residents. So in terms of a prediction, uh, you would really have to talk to her about that. Um, I think as we start to get this vaccination going through our community, uh, yeah. It's going to, we're going to see the case numbers drop. You know, it does take a little bit, a little bit for the, it become effective. And then also we are looking for a level of herd immunity in order to protect those who are unable to get vaccinated. So um, that's a really long answer without a, an official answer to right. your question, which yeah, I, I, I know it would be long, but, but if I was somebody just tuning in, it'd be like, okay, it's the library meeting. Uh, when, when's the library? Like, like, yeah. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think from what I have heard from um, community members and what I, I observe is your library is doing a fantastic, fantastic job of meeting the needs of our residents. And really, they're still able. I mean, there are some services that just aren't achievable in, in the setting that we have now. But you guys are doing a fantastic job still yeah. getting product out and meeting the needs and still offering a service that is in a safe way for everybody. And I think that's a hard balance to have. And I think you guys have done a fantastic job with that balance. At least that's the feedback I'm getting and what I can observe. Yeah, I think they are too. I, I think it's amazing what they've been able to accomplish in, in such a difficult situation. Yeah, yep. and that's the feedback had, I get too. Layla had plans upon plans. I mean, when this was happening, she, came, she was so prepared and so diligent in her um, process that when she came, she came to me it was like yeah this all this all works and that's that's not how it is everywhere it's a lot of you know working with people to come up with a plan that's um safe and protective and uh layla didn't i mean layla had that down so uh, i think the work that she's been doing in the library has also been fantastic for the employees and the patrons can, can i ask you a question that i hadn't sent to layla first um because i, I didn't it, it didn't come up in my mind then, but um, it, it, is there some kind of a, a protocol or something when you go into, when you go into a, like a grocery store in town or, or into a drugstore in town and there, there's somebody with not wearing a mask, is there, is there some way that does the staff confront them or, inform them that they need to put one on or what happens with that? Yeah, so it, it, it really, the governor's orders stand and it is the business's responsibility to enforce those orders. Now, every business will do that in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and we get complaints daily about mm -hmm. uh, either businesses or situations where masks or social distancing aren't being done in the way they're supposed to be. Um, the governor has a clear guideline that he expects us to follow. And 
we have done, I think my inspector has done a fantastic job with education and outreach because really compliance starts with understanding what you're being asked to do. And so mm -hmm. all of our inspections um, have that kind of tone to them. You know, uh, we walk in and if everyone's doing the things they're supposed to do, we just remind them of why it's important. If they're not, uh, we will offer a warning letter. Um, a lot of our complaints are actually coming directly from DPH. So the DPH has a um, uh, either a, a hotline or and and an email service that you can use. East Long Meadow also has a COVID hotline and a COVID email. And if you ask me what it is, it's going to take me a second to find out. That's okay. I won't ask <laughs> Sorry, you. I should know that. Um, usually, I ask Alex. Um, but uh, there is there are standards, and so the standards are you should wear a mask. And actually, the masks are required inside or outside at this point. And um, businesses are supposed to ask you to wear a mask. And people who have medical conditions that um, are exacerbated by wearing a mask are exempt from that uh, requirement. So, you know, if we were to go into a place on a complaint, we would just ask the person, the business, had they asked them to wear a mask? And if they said yes, and they have a medical complaint, that's it. We don't ask any further questions. We don't ask what the medical condition is. I mean, it's very clear that that's kind of the end of the line. Well, I, I it came to mind because um, we mo mostly do Instacart for groceries and stuff, but um, but we needed a couple things and they have senior hours at Stop and Shop. So we went like at seven in the morning because there's hardly anybody there. And we're in there and this young guy comes in with no mask and he's like running through the store. And and I don't think anybody said anything to him. Um, he, he shouldn't have even been there, you know. They, they don't ask for your ID or anything, but I mean, he was obviously, probably in his 20s and although I, they probably think I'm in my 20s too so <laughs> but but it was very annoying because we try very hard to to um, minimize minimize risk in in exposure and so my husband was pretty livid about it he was pretty upset about it and and the guy said yeah sometimes people do and they don't catch them or whatever but and Donna, go, if you if people have a complaint or a concern, um, Donna goes out to every complaint that we get to talk to the, the business, because like I said, education is really the route to compliance. And if we can help people understand what the expectation is and why it's important, we're much more likely to get <clears throat> compliance. So if there's a situation where you feel um, uncomfortable, you're welcome to call my department and we can certainly look into it. Well, thanks a lot, Erica. You said you had some statistics to tell us? Statistics, yes. Uh, okay. So the most recent weekly report we have, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my specific data. Okay. So, uh, and I'm going to give you a history so you understand it in context. So in October, for the entire month of October, we had 122 cases, and I hadn't started breaking it down by age range, but in November I did. We jumped up to 172 cases for the month of November. There were 31 pediatric cases, 79 cases in the age range of 20 to 50, and then 62, 51 plus, and three deaths. Two long-term facility cases. Mm -hmm. So that's different than the spring. So in the spring, um, about two-thirds of our cases were in long-term care facilities. It did uh, go through all of the local long-term care facilities. Uh, so far, we're at we're about the midway, almost exactly the midway point for the month of December, and we're already at 154 cases for the month. We're averaging about 10 cases a day. The age demographics so far this month are 16 pediatric cases, 58 in the age range of demographic 20 to 50, and then 80 in the age range of 51 plus. I think you'll see that age range jump in the 51 plus because it is starting to affect our long-term care facilities at a greater rate. 19 of those 154 cases are in a long-term care facility. So that's kind of the, the data that I'm able to track. Uh, we don't have a public health nurse right now, so it's, it's just me. So the, the data that I would love to track is, is not as much being captured as um, would be ideal in the situation. But I think those give us a general idea of where, it's, where our transmissions are occurring. Um, our biggest clusters that are occurring are really uh, those small, you hear the governor say it, Dr. Fauci, the CDC, those small 
gatherings that happen in a household without masks. I mean, that really is the number one place that um, transmissions are, that are occurring or in a family unit. One of the really fantastic things about um, the contact tracing is that when it happens and it happens right, we're able to help families prevent spread within their homes. So one of the examples that I have of this is we had someone um, who was a close contact and the person who was the, the positive case in that circle um, was really forthcoming with all their close contacts. And we're having a hard time with people being forthcoming with those close contacts. People are really reluctant to share that information. Um, and what that does is it makes it really hard for us to notify the people who they've been exposed to. Um, people feel like they can do it themselves, but then when that happens, there's a lot of misinformation about when should they get tested. People find out they're a close contact and they go get tested the next day. And really, the body, it, your body hasn't amplified the virus fast enough to actually come up positive on a test. So then there's a lot of false negatives happening. So really following the contact tracing process is really important to controlling the spread in our community. So in this, this really, this example, is this, this person found out that they were a close contact and they were able to start wearing masks within their home. Their uh, spouse did become infected because they were infected, they found out, their spouse did become infected, but they were able to prevent their children from becoming infected. And the way they did that was just by wearing masks and well, frequent hand washing. And so had they not been listed as a close contact or had that person tried to do their own contact tracing, um, that may not have been the case. And then we would have had more kids infected and then out in the community also then infecting other kids. So good contact tracing is really key to the prevention within our community and within the library and the municipal buildings in general. Great. So, so what color are we in now for East Long Meadow? We are yellow as of today. So the metrics changed. We were red for a few yes, weeks. Right. And then the governor decided to change the metrics of what makes a red community. And if we were still following the initial metrics, we would we would be blazing hot red. But now, in, in addition to um, the percentage of positivity, you also have to have, um, no, I'm sorry. In addition to the average daily incident rate, you also have to have a certain percent of positivity, which was not the case at the beginning. Uh, so for us to be red, for East Long Meadow to be red, we have to have greater than 10 cases per 100,000. And right now we're at 37, 35.7 cases per 100,000. So we really far exceed that. And, and in addition, we need a 5% positivity. We're, last week we're at 4.57 positivity. So uh -oh. we're really close to that five threshold, but what's really hard to, I can't predict that because that number is based on the number of tests that are given in a 14 day period. I can tell you how many positives are coming in, but I can't tell you how many people have been tested because I don't, I don't find out about the ones that aren't positive. So okay. I used to be able to give Mary a heads up, hey, I think we're gonna be red this week, we're gonna be yellow this week, but now because there's that additional clause and the percent of positivity, it's really hard for us to predict in advance where we're gonna fall. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. So does anybody else have any other questions or Amy, is there anything you want to tell our viewers? I think we, we got the key messages in and I appreciate the opportunity to have a, a, a venue to do that because it was every, great. Different, every different group we talked to has a different group of town uh, people who follow that and it's and anybody we can get this information out to, I think it will benefit everybody. So I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Well, thanks for visiting us tonight. That's yes. great. Anytime. Thank you. Thank they, you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Have a great holiday, holiday season, whichever it you is. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see Christine has joined us. That's great. Yes. I apologize for my lateness. No, that's okay. All right. So now we're all here. Um, the first thing on our agenda uh, is approval of the meeting minutes of November 18th. So I hope everybody has read them. We, we uh, yeah. you know, Layla's done a good job getting them to us earlier, so we have more time yeah. to look at them, and I appreciate that. You know, yeah. some other people do too. So thank you again, Layla. Uh, does any, has, did it, did anybody read over them and have an issue or find something that that they no. didn't like or that they they thought was 
So mm -hmm. I have um, I have one uh, typo that I made under other business. It's in the third line uh, with the mm -hmm. word program. So I uh, I'll send Layla a new copy of the minutes. Okay. And you, you should have that. I just sent them to you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if nobody found anything, and I did read them, so at least there's. Um, Hopefully uh, these are good. And uh, I thought our last meeting was great. This is a big job, it's like three pages of notes. So I wanna thank uh, Melanie for doing all this work. Um, hopefully Kendra will be back and can step back in when she's uh, back from being a mom, uh, an early mom, whatever. Okay, so we've done that. So. May I have a motion to accept the, the meeting minutes from our last meeting? I move that we accept the meeting minutes from the December meeting. All right, thank you, Christina. Do I hear a second? Sorry, October, uh, November meeting, meeting, sorry. I can second it. <laughs> second? Even, can I second it even if I wasn't here for the meeting? Um, I give you my permission. Thank you, Michael, yeah. I'll, I'll second then. <laughs> okay. okay, very good. So uh, that's done. And now we have the new director's report. So Layla, you're on. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so the first section, building maintenance, the fire alarm, security system, and elevator were all inspected in November. All systems are fully functional. Curbside pickup of library materials continues to allow East Long Meadow residents access to library books, DVDs, Kindles, launch pads, playaways, and all other circulating items during the building closure. Circulation has increased steadily since June. In November, the library loaned over 6,300 items through curbside pickup. We are also helping patrons by printing up to 10 pages upon request for no charge and making the print materials available through curbside pickup and extending the library's Wi-Fi signal into the parking lot. The library is experiencing the impact of the predicted fall viral surge. Multiple staff members were out over the past three weeks due to potential COVID-19 exposure and required quarantines. We have been accommodating staff members as best we can. Um, trustee information. The, on Thursday, January 7th at 9.30 a.m., the Attorney General's Office is hosting a virtual training session on open meeting laws. Interested trustees can register through the link provided on my report. We would like to express a sincere thank you to everyone who donated to the Giving Tree this year. We had a successful donation. The, the, the community was just so generous. Uh, the outpouring of gifts and toiletries. We had so many uh, gifts and donations that we were able to ensure that 125 children will have a gift. Uh, and toiletries as well. Um, so thank you again to everyone who donated. Virtual adult programs coming up. Uh, beginning in January, the library will offer an American Sign Language Basics virtual class. The class is held in four sessions in January at 6.30 p.m. on the 6th, 13th, 20th, and 27th via Zoom. The emphasis is to build a usable sign language vocabulary and beginner level American Sign Language structure. Additionally, students will develop appropriate grammar through expressive and repetitive signing skills. Handouts and other online resources will be provided. Classes are hands-on and activity focused. Students will receive homework assignments to help them retain the information they learn during class. You can register for this virtual program on the library's website. On Tuesday, January 19th at 11 a.m., Adult Services Librarian Maura Mara will host a virtual book discussion. The book to be read and discussed is The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Kim Michelle Richardson. Very good. Please register for this virtual program online at eastlongmeadowlibrary.org as well. Uh, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners update. The first set of libraries to meet full requirements are usually brought to the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners for certification in November. Waivers are usually presented in January. As of this writing, 
The Board of Library Commissioners are awaiting the governor's sign off on the fiscal 21 budget, which was approved by the legislature last Friday. If the governor approves the budget as passed by the House and Senate, state aid will be funded at $12 million, a 20% increase over fiscal 20. The plan as described by Mary Rose Quinn and Liz Babbitt, and those are the um, specialists that work with state aid, is to bring forward to the February board meeting the complete list of libraries meeting full requirements for certification. There have been no state aid awards to this point. Revisions to the state aid program policies for fiscal 22, which will reflect, reflect fiscal 21 hours and materials, will go to the board for approval at their January meeting. These changes will be similar to those approved for fiscal 2021 last April, when the materials expenditure requirement and open hours requirements were waived for all libraries in Massachusetts. Oh, I spotted my own typo there. <laughs> uh, the commissioner's vote in January will be retroactive and will cover the entire 2021 fiscal year. Libraries are encouraged to purchase new materials for the collections throughout the year, but will not be penalized for not meeting the spending percentage requirements. The library's fiscal 22 action plan was accepted by the MBLC on November 24th. And that concludes my report for this evening. That was really good. And I would like to also just say that uh, the work that the library is doing, the fact that people can go window shopping for a book is just delightful. Yeah. Um, you know, anybody who's watching, the idea that you can actually walk by a a lot of windows and kind of go window shopping and see what's available for all ages is just great. So yeah. you did a great job. Yeah. You, you and your, 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 you know, your, the library and, and its staff, I think, have just put out an exceptional effort. And I know we all appreciate that. Yeah. All right. So do I, I have, I have a, a quick question, Michael. Um, yeah. I have a quick question for Layla uh, under public services. So the curbside pickup of library materials includes the library books, DVDs, Kindles, launch pads, playaways, and other circulating items. Is the library telescope, the Orion Star Blast telescope, is that also in circulation or no at this time? Yes. It is in circulation. Yep. Has it been taken out at all? Yeah, it's, it's been borrowed. It's still borrowed right now. All right, okay, thank that's you. great. It's nice that we have a, a telescope every once in a while. We see like this, there's like, you know, Saturn and Jupiter are gonna be close together. I don't know if it happened yet, but, but that's having a telescope available is pretty neat. All right, uh, do I have a motion to accept the director's report from uh, or for December 16th, 2020? I'll make a motion to accept the director's report. Okay, thank I second you. that motion. Very good, that's my team. Okay, so uh, we, we have passed that. And our next thing on our um, agenda is committee reports, uh, the gift policy. Um, what do we have there? Let's see, the gift policy. Is, is this something that was due? Uh, well, last month uh, you had assigned Cindy and me to begin looking okay. at this. Okay. Cindy, I don't know if anybody actually no, told Michael, you that. Michael called me. Okay. Like I think it was the day I got home from the hospital, oh. and I, and um, and so he said there was no big rush on it, and I'd be happy to do that um, as soon as I'm a little bit better. Yes, I'm think I was going to ask if we can postpone uh, giving that report uh, till our next meeting, or I don't know, Cindy, would you like any more time than that? Probably the one after that. Okay, so maybe okay. our February meeting. Oh, yeah, February. let's see. Now, the nice I also need a little more time too to right. do some research. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That that's what we need to know. Um, you know, you both have library experience, and I think Cindy told me that she uh was there when the first wall went up is that right cindy oh yeah 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 we, we um the the one who did the signage did the wall and the the idea was we had 
we had hoped that, that you, we didn't know how many more gifts would be coming in. The idea was um, to really help the building program. Um, and it went be, it's gone beyond that now. So uh, they have left space actually so that people could donate afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't think people really know it. It's not labeled well. So we'll see what we can do with that. Okay, Christine? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure it'll be labeled well uh, when it gets done by YouTube. So it's great. <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no big rush. We just want to, you know, when the library opens, it'd be great to, to have it, at least figured out if not done. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, feel feel free if you, you know, if there's somebody who did it before, if you know, you could get some wisdom or quotes of. Uh, somebody who knows how to do that sort of thing, you know, they probably, yeah. you know, once you figure out what you want to put up there, you might be able to get a company that's going to, I mean, I don't know if you're going to repurpose things or have things be redone. That'll all be part of the plan. No, it would be good if, because that, that wall reflected the same kind of thing that runs throughout the whole library with the, the leaf and yeah. that motif. And so it would be good to keep that, I think. That you well, know, that's, that's up to you guys. We want that same that's signage, modern and expandable, and maybe somehow encourage what it should you say. Know, encourage people to give money to the library, to get yeah. their name up on the wall. Right, <laughs> that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, be hung cool. on the wall. All right. So our old business is the cell phone policy, which uh, we have a new draft that was included. Um, did everybody get a chance to read the cell phone, the new cell phone policy? I think Melanie did this, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was working on it, and Layla sent us uh, the draft with the uh, library logo. That's our um, that's our original policy, and Layla had added on the very top the cell phone calls are not permitted anywhere inside the library. Um, right. I think that's very important to have in there. I, I do agree with Layla. Um, one question. I actually had a few questions. Um, so in the first uh, paragraph, it reads, we recognize that ringing cell phones and personal phone conversations can be both distracting and disturbing to others. I was wondering if we need to add the words uh, ringing cell phones or similar devices. I know some libraries did have that language in there and I was curious if the trustees and Layla had any input on that if we have to add the words or similar devices well my mm. ipad can take takes calls and it rings mm -hmm. so i do think you you're definitely that's a great idea on your part that, that right. i think just cell phones is not covering it right in fact i had a watch that actually i have it but i took the phone service off my watch because it was 30 <laughs> bucks a month <laughs> oh. oh wow yeah, but I, I think that's a really good idea too because um, because some people actually use their iPad as a phone. Right. You know. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I would be able to do that, but um, I think you can do that. Yeah. So. Well, and and there's, can you also do that on an, an Android tablet. Right. Maybe. Like, yeah. Probably. Yeah, you could you could be FaceTiming people on it. There you go. Yeah, you could. You could be Zooming. Zooming, exactly. You could use it for Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think that would be the thing to have in there, Melanie. Um, I have a okay, question. Okay, so there, there's one more um, on the, towards the bottom, it reads, library patrons who fail to comply with the above will be asked to leave the building. Library staff has the authority to determine what constitutes disruptive behavior. I really like that. I think we should definitely keep that. One, um, one uh, more thing I'd like to add underneath that, and that's just my recommendation, is disruptive behavior is prohibited. I don't think we have that anywhere in there, did we, Layla? I, I don't think we did. I don't think it would really hurt to add disruptive behavior is prohibited. You could make the sentence longer and say, and <laughs> destructive behavior is prohibited. 
But uh, I, I like that. I when I read it, I was wondering. Or you could say, since, since disruptive um, behavior is prohibited, library staff has the authority to ter determine what constitutes disruptive behavior. You could add it maybe in with that. Okay, so add that in the beginning of that sentence, that second sentence. Yeah, I think so. What do you think? Well, I, as long as it doesn't sound repetitive, you know. Yes, you know, I know. Disruptive or disruptive behavior twice in the same sentence or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm, that's true. Um, I have a question, and that is: Is there a uh, maybe this is a dumb question, but is there a sign somewhere that says, you know, turn off your cell phones like near the door or something? So there's a little bit of a conundrum with the cell phone policy. And that is that we do provide charging stations right. on both the first floor and the second floor. So we don't want to have a big sign up with a phone with the phone band or something, you know, because people yeah. use their phones uh, to, to work, to do all kinds of things. Now they're not just for talking anymore. Right. Right. Um, right. So, uh, so there isn't a sign necessarily, you know, you're thinking of like the, the phone symbol with the red arrow line through it or something like that, because we still want people to be able to use their phones. We just don't want them to talk on the phone in a, in a disruptive manner. Does that answer your, your question, Michael? It does. Uh, you know, libraries are are known for being a place where you're supposed to try to be quiet. You know, I, don't mm -hmm. know if that's I don't know, Cindy, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, within within reason. I mean, libraries are also um, um, places of community activity and programs so that uh, children be, should be seen and not heard is really not the case. And we try to we try to keep the the just the noisiness to specified areas. So if people are coming in during during a story time when there's you know all these kids, they're not going to be quiet. And if you're coming in to study, that might not be the best time for you to come. Okay. Um, and we do have a couple of a study room. So if you really had to be quiet, you could sign up for one of those. Um, so that's kind of a mixed bag now, Michael. Yeah, my not, not to get too far off topic, but there's research that the reason that a phone call is so disruptive is because the person who can hear you, let's say you're next to mm -hmm. that person and they're on the call, you as the listener who's not participating, you are trying to fill in what the respondent is saying. And so it's very, very distracting for a scientific and research-based reason, not just the same example as, as Cindy was using as, for example, a louder story time where people Our are all participating and, and so forth. <laughs> it's the actual physical conversation with having only one person that you can hear and the other person not being able to hear your brain, whether you want it to or not, is going to try to fill in and complete that conversation. Oh. Um, so basically, we just don't want people having these loud, lengthy conversations by themselves, disrupting everybody mm -hmm. in the building. That's why taking it into the vestibule usually is, is a good compromise. Mm -hmm. They can stay out of the elements and so forth, but also not be um, you know, disrupting that person who's tr right next to them trying to work quietly. Okay. Now, I was thinking about um, the disruptive behavior aspect, and and perhaps we could put it in where cell phone calls are permitted anywhere inside the library, and perhaps you could put because cell phone calls are disruptive, um, that that they don't follow our disruptive behavior policy. Or because or, yeah, or, the behavior or, policy does address does address phones. the disruptive portion of it. Yes. Right. 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 So, I'm sure. and, and also, it does mention on here, on the third bullet point, when receiving an incoming call, library patrons should either move to a vestibule or take the call outside the building. So, right. you know, they, you know, we're, we're again, you know, mentioning that, you know, calls should be taken outside of the building mm -hmm. or, or in the vestibule. So I like, I like the idea that we're taking out the disruptive behavior is prohibited, just because we do have it in that 
that last sentence, the library staff has the authority to determine what constitutes disruptive behavior. Um, I, I do have a, a question for Layla. The silent signal function, should we also add or vibrate function? Yeah, you can, add, you, you can add vibrate I mean, if you like Is that to. even worth adding in there? Or yeah, because I didn't know we had a silent signal function. Well, is is it silent signal function and vibrate the same thing? Like, I is thought, there? I I've never, was, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, 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 I always think, thought it was vibrate. I have a very old phone and I know that I can put it on ringtone where you don't even know anybody's calling you because it is on silent. Unfortunately, you always have to be looking at your phone to see that you have an incoming call, but at least you get to see it or the phone will vibrate. So I guess that's, that's why I had asked that. And I know a couple other libraries use that language. Um, yep. Okay. I don't think I can put my hands on that right now, but. So Melanie, do you want to take another crack at this and run it by us next meeting? That would be great. And then um, I can retype it um, and then uh, we can go from there. Okay. okay. So um, in the last meeting when I assigned everybody a different, uh, different um, policies to look at, maybe, to, you know, modernize, uh, I didn't sign myself one. I, I kind of thought as chair, I would not be exempt from it, but be able to help everyone. So if you need another set of eyes, you know, I used to write rules back at, when I worked at Milton Bradley. So um, if you need another set of eyes or if I can help out or you want to like have a meeting or something, I'm, I'm available for all of you. Okay. Uh, Cindy, are you all right? I just got to get up for a minute. Okay. Okay. For those watching, Cindy had her knee replaced, so she's hurting a little bit. We can see you in the mirror, by the way. Oh, so, no. <laughs> I know. So I'm just letting you know in case you would like, you know. Do a summer Thanks for the something. tip. Yeah, you might want to get out of there. Uh, we can still yeah, see I'll be right you. back. Okay. All right. So that's that. Uh, is there any new business? No. No? Okay. No. Friends of the Library Report. Do we have uh, anything there this, this morning? Okay. Um, I have the Friends of the Library Report. Okay. So the Friends held their monthly meeting on Monday, December 7th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, Erica Petrovsky did, uh, she's the circulation supervisor, as you know, she did share um, a few things with the, um, with the Friends. Uh, one of the um, in pieces of information that she shared was that there will be a new computer software program called Evergreen that will be installed in the near future. And it's been determined to be more efficient for patrons and for those who work at the circulation desk. And she did tell the members about upcoming programs such as the popcorn and movies to go and the American Sign Language Basics uh, virtual class, which Layla also reiterated tonight, this evening. Um, so I gave them my usual trustees report. And then also, uh, let me move along my list. The Friends Bylaws, uh, they are continuing on working on those. They're reviewing it and editing it as they go along uh, on each one of their meetings. The members discuss po possible ways to increase membership and provide incentives for members. Currently, there are 262 Friends members. Uh, Diane Tiago also attended a Zoom meeting, uh, Friends Sharing with Friends, it was called. It was hosted by Maura Didi of the MBLC, and that was attended on December 10th. And I guess people there just exchanged ideas and made suggestions on how to help one another. Um, anyone, uh, the director, the staff, um, any trustees who would like to share any or some library information for the Friends next newsletter, um, you can forward that to Diane. Um, so the friends will have their next newsletter coming out. Um, the, deadline date, the deadline date is January 15th of 2021. So if any of uh, you have anything that you would like to add in the friends newsletter, um, you can forward that to Diane and they will, um, they will uh, include that in there. Also, the friends have two vacancies on their board. 
and uh, they want to let you know that you can let people know and they welcome new faces and ideas. And the Friends Next meeting is on Monday, January 4th, uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. So that's all I have right now for the uh, Friends meeting. Thank you. That was great. Sorry for my interruption. That was my grandchildren calling. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> but I, I could I, you know. No, I, you got to take that. <laughs> no, uh, I got to at least say I can't, I, I'm, I'm busy right now. So, all right. So uh, that's good. I have a, a request, which is um, the Friends newsletter. Is that something that we could get a copy of? somehow as trustees? Sure. So what I can do is I can forward you um, my last friend's newsletter. Um, so I can send everybody an email of that copy. Okay. That would be good. Or just uh, a link to it or something like that. That would sure. be great. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, do we have any other business? No. No, um, not uh, yes, I do. do. Okay, cool. Um, hold on. <laughs> no, I, I got to finish writing my, uh, my, my minutes here. Okay. Um, so the last, um, in other business, I have two things to bring up. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so I forwarded everybody the video of the town manager visiting with department heads, and I just wanted to um, let everyone know that I thought it was a great video. Um, I thought Layla did a great job. Um, speaking about the library, I had no idea that the community room was that neat and orderly. I pictured it in my mind, all these bins of books um, and just chaos. So I was really surprised at how neat and organized everything was. Um, so Layla kind of walked us through the library um, inside and outside and told us about it. And the manager, uh, the town manager did um, give a big shout out. Thank you to the friends. Um, of the library as a thank you for the new carpets in the library. So um, we did get to see a, a quick um, video of some of the, uh, a portion of the carpets and I think they look great. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing, the second point that I wanted to make was when I attended the friends meeting, um, I know that there has been discussion um, amongst the trustees um, and, and the library director and also with the friends with the with them um, talking about discussion about a draft MOU. Um, I do want to say that there were two members um, on the friends board who have now volunteered to start doing the research for them to draft the friends MOU. And as you all know, we're, we all know what um, the MOU is and how, what kind of a, um, a simple document that is just outlining. Excuse me, um, Melanie, for those people who are, excuse me, for the people who are listening that don't know what MOU is, right. uh, you want to, you should probably tell them. Sure. So an MOU is a memorandum of understanding. It's usually between two entities. So in this case, um, so the MBLC encourages the friends in the library to have an MOU. And also the second part of that is the ALA or the ALTAFF fact sheet number 26, which is the American Library Trustees um, for uh, Friends Foundations. They also have a fact sheet number 26, which is for the friends and foundations. And in that MOU, they provide you, the ALA provides you with a sample of what an MOU would look like. And it just basically gives a description of the library roles and the friends roles, what, what everybody does to work together towards the same goal. So that's what an MOU is. It's a very simple, simple document and it just explains what everybody does um, to go towards the same goal for a better library. So basically the friends at this point, they had a couple of members um, step up to the plate and they're starting to work on a draft. Um, I know that they're gonna be starting that um, in the month of January, February, I'm not sure. 
Um, I do know that the trustees, you know, know a lot about the MBLC and the ALA. We read a lot of documents when we all came on board as trustees. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a document um, worth us taking a look at with Layla as far as language and just seeing what they have to uh, say in the language. And since I'm part of the trustees slash friends and I'm kind of that liaison and I do attend the friends meeting, what I'd like to do is take a look at their language in their MOU just to see what everything, how it's organized and um, see what they have to say and kind of compare it to the samples that the um, MBLC and the ALA have. Um, so I'd really like to uh, see what their language is and um, work with them and maybe uh, bring some time to the trustees and Layla uh, that document for us to just take a look at and just see um, just see what it's all about. I think that's great. So uh, please do that. Thank you. Yep. Um, is there any other other business? Any other other? No. no. Cindy, are you back? I hear. I'm here. There she is. <laughs> hey, don't, don't say back because my my back isn't happy. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, our next meeting is Wednesday, January twentieth, around six p.m. Okay. Uh, please be there, and. Um, I guess I need a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. I'll make a motion that we adjourn tonight's meeting. Back in the nick I of time. Second that motion. All right, that's my team. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we're adjourning the meeting. Uh, happy holidays to all of you. Everybody. Uh, yep. If Same there's to anything you. I can do to help any Thanks. of you with anything, you know, I live in town. So, uh, and you know, we're a team. So, we are a you team. know, let's. Uh, Let's meet together and I'll be happy and healthy in January. Okay? Yeah. Awesome. I hope I will be too. Sounds good. <laughs> or at least better. Take care. Take care, everybody. Good night. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.